Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Back in our Father's Word, Book of Jeremiah, whom God launches forth. Uh, we come to the 49th chapter. We're going to pick it up in the 17th verse here in a moment. It has to do with, um, with uh, Edom, which means in the Hebrew tongue, red, the red nation. And, of course, it would be Esau's offspring. Uh, and we know from Genesis chapter 27 that he was driven away from the fat of the land, properly translated. And naturally, when you read Ezekiel chapter 20, 38, you find chief prince Meshach, which is Rush in the Hebrew tongue, R-O-S-H. So later by the Volga changed to Rush, R-U-S-S, and then later Russia. So here you have... The, the way our Father teaches is there's nothing new under the sun. That that has been shall be again. So history itself then becomes prophecy because it's going down again and it's going down in the future sense exactly the same way. So this is like reading tomorrow's newspaper concerning what happens to Russia. And so this has nothing to do with Christian people inside Russia, but it has to do with atheistic communism and how our father dislikes it. You can see why that he would say in um, the great book of Malachi and, and uh, also in the New Testament, Jacob I loved and Esau I hated. He hated him because he cared nothing about his heritage. And, and so it is. So having, with, with God still speaking towards Edom, Rush, let's pick it up if we may. Chapter 49, verse 17, a word of wisdom from our Father, and it reads, And Edom, Rush, that is to say, shall be a desolation. Everyone that goeth uh, by it shall be astonished, and shall hiss at all the plagues thereof. Uh, verse 18, And as in as in the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah. And the neighbor cities thereof, saith the Lord, no man shall abide there, neither shall a son of a man dwell in it. Um, and and uh, wh what you have here is, in all the Gentile nations he's mentioned, he's always said at the end, if they repent, he doesn't even ask these for repentance. Naturally, it's there if they do it on their own, but again, I would repeat, this people, God would say, while they were still in their mother's womb, as it is written in, um, in that great book of Romans. Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. And you can see well why. And um, no mortal soul that follows Christ you're going to find uh, in that particular place at that particular time, the end times. Verse 19 Behold, he shall come up like a lion from the swelling of Jordan. And who is this? In history, it was Nebuchadnezzar. Well, what is it then in the future sense? The king of Babylon, which is Antichrist. And uh, against the habitation of the strong, but I will suddenly make him run away from her. And who is a chosen man that I may appoint over her? For who is like me? He said, who, who can I send? Who can I compare to me? And who will appoint me the time? When am I going to do this? And who is that shepherd that shall stand before me? And naturally, when you make that stand, you stand in the word of God, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. But of course, it is Yeshua, the Lord Jesus Christ, that is the shepherd of shepherds. And at that time, at his second advent, shall he make that stand. Verse 20, therefore hear the counsel of the Lord. You want to listen to wisdom? Listen to your father. That he hath taken against Edom, not for it against. 
in his purpose that he hath purposed against the inhabitants of Timon, that's south uh, Russia, surely the least of the flock shall draw them out. In other words, we'll drag them out. There's no, no power in them. Surely he shall make that, their habitations desolate with them. It, it will amount to nothing. Again, when you, try, when you be, establish a government that drives God from your vocabulary, that is atheistic, communistic, and you expect God to bless it, forget it. Verse 21, the earth is moved at the noise of their fall. At the cry, the noise thereof was heard in the Red Sea. The Reed Sea and the Weedy Sea is going to be done all the way through. 22, behold, he shall come up and fly as an eagle, the Antichrist. They're going to think he is perfect. And spread his wings over Basra, right over that old um, uh, strong fort. And at that day shall the heart of the mighty men of Edom, Rush, be as the heart of a woman in pains. In other words, labor pains that bring about the birth of a new age. You're reading it from our father's mouth. That's his counsel. That's exactly how it will go down when we approach that time of, of, of the um, second advent. Now, again, I want you to note, most nations, he has offered an opening for them to repent. That was the last verse on Russia. And there is no invitation it is there if they on their own cognizance take the step forward. I'm talking about it as individuals. That when it comes to that time of the birth of a new age, up to that time, as individuals, they can convert and bring Christ and Yahweh, Almighty God, back into their life and be blessed. Now, verse 23, we change peoples now. Again, this is God's uh, letter concerning the Gentile nations. Verse 23 reads, Concerning Damascus, this is Syria, Hamath is confounded. And Hamath is the entering place of the Kenite, quite frankly. And Arthad, um, for they have heard evil tidings. They are faint-hearted. There is sorrow on the sea. It cannot be quiet. Um, and certainly, as it is, at that coming, our Father is so much. That they, they can't find any rest anywhere. Verse 24, Damascus. What does Damascus mean? It means tame heifer. Okay. Meaning, they, they're not all that much push there. Damascus is waxed feeble and turneth herself to flee and fear hath seized on her. Anguish and sorrows have taken her as a woman in travail. In other words, they come right up to the birth of a new age. And they, again, you have a time element here. This is just before the second advent in the future is since. Look at Syria today and look well and long. Verse 25. How is the city of praise not left and, and the city of my joy? What, what he's saying here is they, they weren't even intelligent enough that when, when the enemy came to run, to flee, they just stood there like, like a tame old heifer, Damascus. Verse 26, Therefore her young men shall fall in her streets. And all the men of war shall be cut off in that day, saith the Lord of hosts. And um, you can see what our father thinks of Syria. 27, and I will kindle a fire in the wall of Damascus, and it shall consume the palaces of Ben-Hadad. Ben-Hadad is, is one of the sons of Ishmael. And here we, it, it means mighty, the son of the mighty. They swarm and swarm as the locust, and certainly um, very difficult to reason with, very difficult to have a purpose. 
and so it is that um, he leaves them. That's his, that is his wisdom concerning Syria. Verse 28. Concerning Kedar, and, and, and Kedar, this is the son of Ishmael, okay, also. And concerning the kingdoms of Hazar, that's to say the castle, which Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, shall smite. Thus saith the Lord, Arise ye, go up to Kedar, and spoil the men of the east. Um, this is all the way even over uh, to the east, and it is all the swarm that will swarm in that general area. Verse 29, Their tents and their flocks shall they take away. They shall take to themselves their curtains and all their vessels, and their camels, that's their way of doing commerce, and they shall cry unto them, fear is on every side. Um, and, and so it is, this, this just east of Palestine, and, and uh, certainly our father's not happy with this group. And certainly he does not say that many good things concerning, why, they don't follow him. This is why he, um, wishes, it is his hope, that all would come to repentance. And this is why that on the first day of the millennium, every knee, <clears throat> every knee from these tribes will bow to Almighty God. Why? Because he owns their souls. But he gives you this picture of this time, and through history he lets you know how it happened the first time, so it shall happen again. And, um, and, and so it is. Verse 30 to continue. Flee and get you far off. Dwell deep. No, you dig you a deep hole. O you inhabitants of Hazar, that old castle, saith the Lord. For Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, hath taken counsel against you and hath conceived a purpose against you. Now, uh, wh what is it? Well, what's, what is the Antichrist's purpose? It's no, no biggie. He intends to take over the world by claiming to be God himself, claiming to be the savior or the leader of every belief, every denomination, every sect. Uh, he'll say, I'm your man. And you know something? With the miracles that God allows him to perform, he does deceive most of the world. We're coming very near to that time, I feel, and I don't have any doubt about that because we're in the generation of the fig tree. And this Nebuchadnezzar here is the equivalent is the king of Babylon at the end, the Antichrist. He will deceive many people. He has a purpose. It's certainly not for Christianity. Verse 31, Arise and get you up into the wealthy nation that dwelleth without care saith the Lord, which hath neither gates nor bars, which dwell alone. Well, what, what nation would that be? Well, he's talking about the United States of America. We're a nation that does not have walled cities. We do not have gates to every town. Our wall is Almighty God, if you read the 38th chapter of Ezekiel. God is our wall. And certainly, what is this wealthy nation, though its wealth is dwindling because of mismanagement? But certainly, this is who they should look to, and unfortunately, many of them have come here with the wrong ideas. I think the Twin Towers would um, be a witness to that. Um, <clears throat> but God would not leave the superpower of superpowers out of his word of God. So therefore, when he said the United States would be the gathering place, that is to say that rich nation, unwalled, again, you can read of it in Ezekiel, God is our wall. He protects us. You know, that's why when you run your hand in your pocket, pull out a coin, it says, in God we trust. We do. I know there are many among us that do not, but we do not fall in the category of the nation Edom, who Esau, which drives God from the country, there's still the majority of our people love our Father. And um, 
that causes many people to be drawn to that freedom. Verse 32. And their camels, that's their way of trade and commerce, shall be a booty, and the multitude of their cattle a spoil. And I will scatter into all winds them that are in the uttermost corners, and I will bring their calamity from all sides thereof, saith the Lord. It doesn't pay to go against God's people. He will destroy them. You should take great comfort in that. God loves his children, those that follow him, and he is that wall, and he doesn't need help from, from um, anyone other than he is the shepherd that can stand. Verse 33, And Hazor, that old, that old castle, shall be a dwelling for dragons, jekylls, and a desolation forever. There shall no man abide there, nor any son of man dwell in it. Um, and here, here we have that word concerning uh, Hazar, concerning Kedar, which um, the son of Ishmael, the swarmers of the end times. Uh, it still would say, then why, why will they not dwell there? Because they'll be following the true God if they are true. And here you have God's counsel concerning the nations. And he continues, verse 34. The word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah the prophet against Elam in the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, saying, now, now I want you to think on this a moment. What does Elam translate to? the hidden ones, the veiled ones, the ones that operate and not and, and a, attempt to not be seen. Zedekiah was the last king of Judah before the captivity. He was blinded and led in chains to Babylon and killed there. But here we have this one that uh, is the hidden one and does not like to be recognized quite frankly. It's very difficult to, to do covert actions against a free people if you're not hidden. Verse 35, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will break the bow of Elam, the hidden ones, the chief of their might. And so it is, they will, um, there, there is no way that anyone can stand against God. This has to do, if you would, with the tares, and God will run a sword in, and he will harvest uh, Elam. 36, And upon Elam will I bring the four winds from the four quarters of heaven, and will scatter them toward all those winds, and there shall be no nation whether the outcast of Elam shall not come. In other words, they're going to scatter, these hidden ones are going to scatter into na every nation of the world. And um, every time you want to be real sharp, when the four winds of heaven are mentioned, what does that mean? It means you're right at the door. The very knock is on that door of the consummation of the end of this age. Because when those four winds concentrate on one spot, that is the end. Do you not remember in Revelation chapter 7 where they were about to bring the four winds to cause the end and an angel appeared and said, stop! Until we have the seal of God in the foreheads of God's elect, you cannot bring the four winds. And then in the seventh chapter of Daniel, you have again the four winds that consummate the end of this age. In Ezekiel chapter 37, you have the four winds that bring into one valley the whole house of Israel, meaning the end. We come to that time, and you're reading about it here concerning the hidden ones, the tares that mix in, that God said, leave them alone. I will take care of them, along with the angels uh, will, with, will assist me. Verse 37, to continue. For I will cause Elam, I will cause these hidden ones to be dismayed before their enemies and before them that seek their life. That's their very soul. And I will bring evil upon them, 
even my furious anger, that's the wrath of God, saith the Lord, and I will send the sword after them till I have consumed them. And there you have the tares in, as they are harvested at the very end of the millennium and cast into that lake of fire. God himself will harvest them. As, as it is written in Mark, Matthew chapter 13, beginning with verse um, 35 and continuing. Verse 38, And I will set my throne in Elam. That's my favorite spot. And will destroy from thence the king of the princes, saith the Lord. Well, and how do you know what spot that is? Well, have you ever read Second Thessalonians chapter 2? Where is it that Satan sets his throne? Right on the Mount of God. It's God's favorite place, Mount Zion. God said, I'm, I'm taking him off. I'm rooting him out. I'm going to destroy him. And so it is that our Father will. Um, verse 39 to complete. But it shall come to pass in the latter days. You wondered when this would be? At the end. That I will bring again the captivity of Elam, saith the Lord. They're not going to exist. They're going to be captivated by the real truth. And so it is. No longer allowed the hidden to scatter out among the nations. And to pull strings and twist knobs. To bring things to their benefit. Little workers of Satan himself. God has given you his address concerning them. It is written, and Christ gives you a second witness concerning the tares in the great 13th chapter of the book of Matthew. So there you have, uh, the, so far, those nations. And so it is that God's still on that throne, still in control. You want to watch these nations as we have covered them. It will happen to them exactly as it's written. No ifs, no ands, no maybes. Chapter 50, verse 1. We come now to the fall of confusion. And when confusion falls, it brings in understanding and clarity. Because Babylon is confusion, and Babel is exactly that, nothing but Babel. No common sense connected there too. Chapter 50, verse 1, and this would be the 50th prophecy by Jeremiah. The word that the Lord spake against and concerning Babylon and against the land of the Chaldeans by Jeremiah the prophet. The Chaldeans, there were five dialects, and were, what, what land are you talking about? Iraq. The city of Babylon, old Babylon, rests right in this nation of Iraq. As a matter of fact, Saddam Hussein rebuilt the city of Babylon. It uh, lies on the Tigris uh, River about 67 miles south of Baghdad. And there you have it, geographically speaking. But Babylon that is to say, Babel and confusion has also spread over the world, spiritually speaking. So we do have a geographical location to pinpoint prophecies. But at the same time, a wise person knows confusion is rampant and covers the whole world. Verse 2 to continue. Declare you among the nations and publish and set up a standard, let that standard be Christ. Publish, and conceal not. Say, Babylon is taken, confusion is taken. Baal is confounded, that's what their god, Baal worship. Merodach, that means death in the Hebrew tongue, is broken in pieces. Her idols are confounded. Her images are broken in pieces. In Revelation chapter 14, 8, Babylon fallen, 16, Babylon fallen, give her her double. That's confusion. And unfortunately, what the king of Babylon being the false Christ, all the people of the world that 
do not recognize him as the false will receive him as the true Christ because he does miracles and he claims to be the true Christ. That's why in the Greek tongue, in Antichrist, properly translated, is instead of Christ. He comes in the stead of Christ to deceive the nations that have not read this letter that God has sent you to prepare you whereby you are not taken into babble or confusion but have Christ to stand upon that standard of truth that sets you free from the anxieties of this world, whereby you avoid Baal, Baal worship, and Murdoch, which is to say death of the very soul. Verse 3. For out of the north there cometh up a nation against her, which shall make her land desolate, and none shall dwell therein. They shall remove they shall depart, both man and beast. Uh, and, and so it is that it is written when you read Isaiah chapter 14 of Satan himself, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? And why is it that you take the side of the north? Because when you go to Mount Zion in the temple of, that God designed, God's throne is on the north. And it is that throne that Satan wants. It is God's throne. That's what caused his pride and jealousy to cause him to fall, as it is written in Ezekiel chapter 28. Verse 4. In those days, and in that time, saith the Lord, the children of Israel shall come, they and the children of Judah together. They're not separated at this time, so that lets you know. Going and weeping, they shall go and seek the Lord their God. Finally, they'll begin to wake up to the truth of God's word. And the both, as, as it would tell you in Ezekiel chapter 37, take a stick, Ezekiel, right? One Judah, one Israel, join those two sticks together. Well, here, finally, the house of Israel and the house of Judah are joined back together in seeking the true Lord. They have outgrown the fact of knowing who the fake is and turn to the true Father. Verse 5, to continue, They shall ask the way to Zion with their faces to the wood, saying, Come, and let us join ourselves to the Lord in a perpetual covenant that shall not be forgotten. Well, if you're a student of God's word, we already have a perpetual covenant. And to you, it is not forgotten. And certainly God hasn't forgotten it. It's the Abrahamic covenant. And there is the covenant with David. There is God's covenant to every individual that loves him, that believes upon him. And there is certainly no forgetting it to those who can remember. You know, um, many people do forget because they don't know who they are. Most of the house of Israel and the house of Judah call themselves Gentiles. I'm talking about the true houses. Why? Because they've been taught that way. Well, by who? Well, now give me one guess. Who? Let's see, the Kenites were scribes for Judah back in 1 Chronicles chapter 2, verse 55. That was way back 1000 B.C. If you've got the Kenites keeping books for you, guess who gets deceit if you're not careful? That's why a good Christian scholar is, is a, a must, especially in this generation, what we call the end times, the last days. They've forgotten when it was there all the time. God's blessings, God's love for his children. Verse 6, My people have been lost sheep. Their shepherds have caused them to go astray. That's, their preachers will not preach the truth of who they are. They have caused them to go astray. They have turned them away on the mountains. They have gone from mountain to hill. They have forgotten their resting place. Well, pray tell me, who, where is our resting place? What does Sabbath mean in the Hebrew tongue? Rest. Who became our high Sabbath? Christ. 
So if you forget the true Christ for the fake, the confusion, then you have no rest. You have want no peace of mind. Peace of mind comes from seeing and hearing the word of God with faith, knowing it is true, and that you have that resting place always, and it is the, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, God with us. Don't ever let anyone take that resting place away from you, or you will be a wandering, miserable soul. When, that's such a shame. When you have the Prince of Peace, as your resting place, as your Sabbathing place. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6 and 7. Verse 7 to continue. All that found them have devoured them. They took advantage of it. And their adversaries said, We offend not, because they have sinned against the Lord the habitation of justice, even the Lord, the hope of their fathers. They've abandoned him. They're lost. They don't know who they are. And, and that, is, that is to the, well, why did God let that happen? He didn't. The shepherds did. Back in verse 6, do you remember? Well, are, are you accusing preachers of misleading people? No, I, I didn't. God did makes it pretty obvious when nobody knows who they are. When anyone would let their birthright, their dignity in being a nation of nations, a nation that is supposed to bring peace, <clears throat> a nation that has such a beautiful resting place, would allow itself to be misled, confused, misguided, and taken down Primrose Lane. Why? Because of the shepherds. You know, a shepherd makes sure his sheep have a good pasture. And a good pasture is always headed by a good pastor. So you have wonderful food from the word of God. It's the best pasture you'll ever have is grazing in the word of God, absorbing it, letting it strengthen you from toe to the very tip of your head spiritually speaking, give you, giving you eternal life. Okay, don't miss the next lecture. Bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? The Strong's Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible is an invaluable tool to the serious Bible student. The Strong's Concordance lists every word used in the Bible and every passage where the word utilized may be found in the scriptures. With the assistance of a reference numbering system, the English reader may easily translate any word back to the original Hebrew, Chaldee, or Greek in which God's word was written. The Companion Bible is a unique study Bible. In addition to the text of the King James Version Bible, an extra wide margin contains a wealth of information not found in other Bibles. A system of structures or outlines employed by the Companion Bible will allow the readers to rightly divide the Bible. The use of these structures help the reader follow the subject matter and therefore they are critical to an understanding of God's word. The 198 appendixes found in the Bible cover a wide variety of topics and information which will enlighten your studies. The Companion Bible and Strongest Concordance are a must for the serious Bible student. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves and you have a question, you share it. Would you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular denomination, reverend, or some organization. We do not judge people. But uh, God does the judging. All you do is teach. Don't ever apologize for the word. Let the chips fall wherever they may. Those of you that listen by shortwave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you. And your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Always a pleasure. Now, you've got a prayer request, you don't need the number or an address why God knows what you're thinking, why he loves you. He may not love what you do always, but he does love you. So, uh, Hosea chapter 6, verse 6, I don't want your burnt offerings, I want your mercy, let's say your love, because indeed he does love you. 
You understand he created you for his pleasure. Do you know where that's written? Uh, Revelation chapter 4, the last verse. All things he created for his pleasure. You give him no pleasure and he will give you no blessings. If he mainly is blessed by your love to him, give it graciously and let him know what a father we have. Father, around the world we come, we ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, and question time, and we're going to go with Connie from Michigan. When a person dies abruptly from accident, heart attack, and so forth, how does that person reach heaven? How long should a person grieve over their loss? Is there a special way to grieve? Well, always do it God's way, of course, and I'll, we'll talk on that in a moment. When, when a person dies abruptly, it, that's whether it's abruptly or long drawn out. Once the silver cord parts, meaning you die, instantly your soul returns to the Father who gave it. Why? Well, no, you misunderstand, brother. The scripture says your spirit returns to the Father. Well, your spirit is the intellect of your soul, which is encased therein. So naturally the soul also goes, along with your spiritual body. How long should a person grieve over a loss? You know, it, it is human nature that we miss someone but as a Christian, at the same time, we have to be happy for them. Because as it's written in Luke chapter 16, they're in paradise. Whether they're on this side of the gulf or the other, that we can work out through the millennium. But um, uh, it's, it is one thing to grieve, and it is another thing to feel good for somebody that doesn't suffer anymore. They're with the Father. And uh, in their real body, not, not these uh, flesh things, and, um, and if they were Christian, they have eternity, they have eternity made. Gertrude from, Gertrude from Florida. Do you all s s sell the original manuscripts? Well, we, you know, we have a way that you can have the best available copy of manuscripts. Now, this is to say, you have to, uh, Mr. Green uh, has uh, taken from, the, from Great Britain one of the better sets of manuscripts that you can ever uh, have at this time. They're not the original, but they're as close as you can get to it. And it's called the Greens in a Linear. I would rather you took the Strong's and did the translating yourself. But it, it is for deeper students that wish to have a set of the Greek, the Hebrew, the Aramaic, as it is utilized in the manuscripts, and uh, work with it yourself. But that's, that's what we do have those, and they are available for someone that wishes the deeper study. Elaine from Pennsylvania, Pastor, since we know it is taught in the Word that God is not a respecter of persons, do you think he is a respecter of political parties? Well, he's a respecter of anything that is right, according to his will. So naturally, um, let's uh, I have mentioned today atheistic communism. Do you think God is a respecter of them? Of course not. He even says the founder thereof, Esau, I, I hated him while he was still in his mother's womb. Why? Because of what happened in the first earth age. And, uh, and so it is. God, God uh, respects those that do his will, whether it's in a political sense and or otherwise. <coughs> Excuse me. He would not wish you to make a religion out of politics or politics into a religion. Uh, they, they both have their own purposes. Jerry from Virginia, where can I find in the Bible the scriptures on the four fallen angels? I'm going to assume that you mean in Revelation chapter 9, verse 14, the four angels bound, which makes them fallen because they are in chains, that are released at the Euphrates River. Revelation chapter 9, verse 14. John from Georgia was Jesus' name really Emmanuel or Yeshua? 
where do we get the name Jesus from? Well, in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, God said, A virgin will conceive, she will have a male child, and you will call him Emmanuel, being translated God with us. In other words, is that a name? Well, yes it is, but it's a description of who he is. And not many people can totally grasp that. The Godhead is a lot easier to understand if you can grasp that. Why would God say, call him Emmanuel? Because it was exactly that. When God does the translating for you, do not question it. It is not up for grabs. It is God with us. That's who Jesus was. Now, uh, Yeshua, of course, is the Hebrew name of Yahweh's Savior. And that is Hebrew. That is the Hebrew tongue and language. And when this is converted to English, it is Jesus. Uh, and it means still Yahweh's Savior. Uh, Jane Jasmine, rather, from Tennessee. Pastor Murray, I have heard you say not to judge, but don't you judge when you condemn people? Have you ever heard me condemn a person by name? I assure you, you have not. I do not judge nor condemn people. I condemn methods of teaching sometimes if it's false. I will condemn Satan by name. But when it comes to individuals, that's God's business. You have ne never heard me speak of, as a matter of fact, when I say, don't ask uh, for, uh, for us to make an, a, a, a statement concerning a reverend or a denomination, because we will not judge people. I realize we've got a lot of people that will judge uh, even this man, but I will judge no one. I leave that to the Father. I will judge what is correct and false in teaching and ways of life, you betcha. Sila from Illinois. Do you think that those people's souls that have not yet passed through um, water, that means the bag of water at birth, and are still with the Father, can see what's happening here in our dimension? And when Christ was here and we were still with the Father, did we witness all that Christ did when he was here? Well, I believe certainly that there is a certain amount of that, but... When one is, the idea of this earth age is that each soul from the first earth age would be born innocent. And the only way you can have innocent is to have a babe in the womb and all memory of what was is restricted, from, taken from that one. And he is born into these flesh bodies and this earth age and this dimension to decide whether he or she will love God or Satan. And that's what God wants to know. Um, and even if you were bad in the first earth age, you have the Savior in this one if you participate. I, I cannot say definitely that they are aware, but I feel they quite well are. Because God has created people for his pleasure, so he's got a lot of them around him. Linda from California, did the Jews kill Jesus? What was the name of the other man that people wanted to let go? The Jews did not kill Jesus. The Kenites did. The Kenites that had slipped in among the people kept yelling, crucify him, and, and were our experts at elevating the tension and pressure in a crowd and naturally, the man who they did request to be let go was Barabbas. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. And when you say Barabbas, what do you say? You say son of the father. Okay. Son of his father. Barabbas. Uh, Bar is son of his father, and so was Christ the son of the father, the true father. They chose wrong. They chose Barabbas.
But the Kenites brought it to pass, and that is why it is written in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, that Christ came to this earth to die on the cross to destroy death, which is to say the devil, and it is his, the devil's offspring, the Kenites, that bring much misery to the world unless you're sharp enough to know who they are, what they are, and what they try. Teresa from Virginia, when does the month end on a solar calendar? Does it end on a full moon or a new moon? Or how does it work? You know, you must understand that moons are night, okay, of the night. All prophecies given on the uh, moon calendar, month calendar, are concerning Satan usually. Not usually, they always are. And the calendar that has to do with the two witnesses or, or God's children are done in days, days, 1,260 days and so forth. Why? Because we're children of the light. So there are no months in the solar calendar. You have, you take the spring equinox, that starts the new year. It happens at the same moment practically every year, year in, year out. No ifs, no ends, no maybes. And 14 days later, you, when the 15th day begins, it's Passover. And then following those 15 days, there are seven sets of 50, not 30. They're not called months. They're called periods. There are seven sets of 50. And, um, uh, and there you have it. That is the solar calendar. When you get through with that seven sets of 50 after the 15th day, you come back to the spring equinox again and start all over. It's a perfect calendar. Uh, Lynn from Indiana. When praying and asking for forgiveness for my sins, do I need to be specific and atomize each, atomize each sin, or can I ask for forgiveness for all my sins? You, you know, God is very understanding, and if you're sincere and you want to repent for all your sins, you can say that. If, you have a, if one sin in particular is really convicting you, then I would, I would ask special attention to that one. If it made me feel more complete, he'll forgive you. And, um, but it is sufficient to say, repent for all your sins, to want to serve God, but don't ever try to con him. He, he, knows when, he knows what you're thinking, so you can't con God. So however you say it, he knows whether you're real or not. David from Tennessee, what does the Bible say about cremation and is it okay? The, the cremation is okay. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 3. Read it for yourself. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 3. If you uh, are minus charity, even though you would give yourself to be cremated, uh, it's not void without charity, loving our Heavenly Father. When, as it is written in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 6 and 7, when you part this flesh body, it goes back to dirt. That's where it came from. The food you eat is growing from the soil. It is organic. The body is organic. It goes back to the soil again. But your spirit body, which is your real body, returns to the Father that gave it, okay? There's nothing wrong with cremation, especially when troubled times as we have, that everything is so expensive. It's perfectly um, spiritually okay, all right, with our Father. June from Oregon, since the Hebrew children were being killed by the Egyptians at the birth of Moses, how did Moses have a brother, Aaron? Why was he not killed as a baby? Because he was older. He, he was born way before that edict went forth, okay? Aaron was Moses' older brother. The edict was to kill all the male children born, okay, to the midwives. Aaron was way past midwife stage. He, he was a young child. 
Uh, Donna from North Carolina, so it, naturally it didn't apply to him. Uh, Donna from North Carolina. Because I know somewhere in my Bible, God says, whosoever that changes one, one word of his teachings are bound uh, for uh, fall. I, you know, I, it seems like I had that question in the last lecture. I can't remember for sure, but I think so. It's, you'll read what you're looking for. You'll find in Revelation chapter 22, verse 18 or 19, verse 18, I'm going to say. It's 18 or 19. <clears throat> in other words, if you read the last three verses in the Bible, King James, you will read the verse you're looking for. <clears throat> okay, we got uh, Clara from Florida. I have read a couple of books that have interpreted the daughter of Babylon to be the United States of America because the authors believe that we as a nation at this point in time meet all the descriptions of the daughter of Babylon. Uh, who do you think the daughter of Babylon is? <clears throat> well, have you ever studied God's Bible? His book, it tells you. Okay, You, you can read of her there in uh, old mystery Babylon. The queen, go to, go to Revelation chapter 17. She, what does she ride? She's riding a beast system, a world political system that's headed by the Antichrist. And she loves to ride that thing because he's saying, I've come to rapture you away. So everyone that is looking forward to that big flyaway moment by him, Revelation 17, is really confused because nobody's flying anywhere. Christ is here, coming here to establish the kingdom, not somewhere else. And uh, certainly um, Babylon means confusion and it is a state of mind. The United States of America is a blessed nation. It is not a nation of Babylon, but there are many people in our nation that are confused, but not nearly as many as there are in the world. Okay. Uh, because we have some people, we have many people in this nation that know the truth, and the truth has set them free from that confusion. And they know who the false Christ is, they know he comes first, and they're going to make a stand against him. So don't try to call this nation, who many of us have shed blood for, in fighting for its freedom, Babylon. It's not. Okay, Exodus 13 verse 19 why did Moses take the bones of Joseph with him I thought to die your bones go back to dust and your spirit goes back to the father why did this happen well he, he naturally it takes a long period of time for bones to deteriorate and then as much as he died in Egypt he wanted his bones back home uh, that, that, that's perfectly legitimate nothing wrong with that Many people that pass away, away from their home birthplace or home place or whatever, today have their remains taken back and disposed of at home, buried, whatever the case may be. Debbie from Kentucky. Uh, our son, about four and a half years ago, our son died. My husband and I were with him for 30 days, 24 hours a day. We were his guardians since his, he was divorced. My question is, the night we had to take him off life support, his heart and lungs kept him alive for about 10 hours, but I kept telling him he didn't have to fight anymore, that the angels were waiting to take him home. Was I wrong in saying that? You cannot understand how much you have helped us in the past four and a half years. Well, thank you. The Word has. The Word will do that for you. You, you, when you say that, you put it in God's hands, and, and uh, it's perfectly all right. Always when you pray, pray God's will, and that way, if, and God is very intelligent, very compassionate. He heard you, and, um, and, and he took him, and he's putting an army together there to come back soon and straighten things out here. I suppose your son's in that army now. Uh, Sharon from Delaware, uh, thank you for my, your statement about our staff. My question is this, 
in the beginning, God said, let us create man in our image. Wasn't he speaking to Jesus, his own heart and son, and the Holy Spirit? You say he was speaking to the angels, but wouldn't that take the angels, make them co-creators? No, not at all. He said, I'm going to make them look like you look. The word in the Hebrew is Elohim. That's not Holy Spirit. That's not, that's not um, Jesus Christ. It's El, God, and his children. So it's pretty specific. It isn't up for grabs, okay? And that's why you look like you look. Because he made you in that image. Don from New York. I have submitted questions several times, but so far have not used on your program possibly too controversial. Well, let's check it out. My question, doesn't the United States and Great Britain fit the description of Joseph's two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, mentioned in Genesis 49.9? Of course it does. One of them even means forgetful, and certainly they do fit that uh, prophecy that is given there. And I even teach this if you've studied with me for any period of time, and I am out of time. I love you all because you enjoy studying God's Word chapter by chapter, verse by verse, but most of all, God loves you for that. Why? It's His letter to you. And when you study it, it makes His day. And when you, and I do mean you, make God's day, boy, is He going to bless you. You let Him know you love Him. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, bless God. He will always bless you. Most important, though, you listen to me. You listen good. You stay in his word. Every day in his word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus Yeshua is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas. 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program and God bless you. The book of Peter, here we have two books, First and Second Peter, that, that are absolutely fascinating. That great old fisherman, telling us, leading us, directing us, guiding us, going into the depth, if you would, in that second book, into the three earth ages, giving the most accurate recorded account of the events that transpire and document that there are three earth ages, that there was one before this one, this one, and one to come. Peter, the great fisherman, which in his gentleness and his kindness, brings us uh, two books, the books of Peter, that lead, guide, direct, even in your daily life, that teach and show you how to be happy, how to find that peace of mind, and to know yourself. The books of Peter, I know you're going to enjoy them.
what is then? Okay. That's, I just want to play with this a little bit. I want to talk about it. Um, sometimes we can, we can uh, per perhaps state with oversimplicity, but when God says something, as long as he's not speaking in a parable, don't try to change it. You know, when, when God speaks that is not in a parable, you don't need someone to interpret it for you. He means what he says. All you have to do is listen. Okay? So open your Bibles, if you would, to Genesis in the beginning, chapter 2 and verse 7. And let's see what, how God formed man. And this, incidentally, for those that uh, want to make a deeper study, this is eth Adam, the forming thereof. Chapter 2, verse 7, and it reads, And the Lord God formed... This is a Hebrew...